So the origin of life is one of the kind of the big questions in science. Um, and it really is a question in science. You know, physics is relevant, chemistry is relevant, biology is relevant, geology and so on. And so all these, these kind of disciplines which have got their you know, hundreds of years of intellectual history behind them and ways of seeing questions, they all kind of clash together. So what we're really trying to do is use life as a guide to the origin of life. Um, and it's turning out to be surprisingly productive. Um, perhaps you shouldn't surprise anybody, uh, but, but um, it really does, it really works. So we're starting out with this basic kind of structure and charge and so on and asking can we get hydrogen to react with CO2 to make the basic building blocks of life, uh, which happen to be what are called Krebs cycle intermediates, but they're basically molecules that contain just carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. And that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's your starting point, and then from there you can make amino acids. And mm -hmm. We've done that, and other people have done that. And you can make sugars from from there as well. This is what biochemistry does. This is basically the the core of biochemistry as we know it. Um, and, and from there you make the nucleotide building blocks of DNA and RNA and the, you know, the informational molecules, and um, the, the, the lipids that make up the membranes themselves, so fatty acids and things like that, they all come from this simple core of biochemistry. Mm -hmm. So there's three ways in which we are thinking about life as a guide. The first one is energy flow, what's it doing? Um, because life is weird, it's using, uh, it's using electrical charges on membranes to drive everything basically. Forget about a chemical currency like ATP or something, it's the electrical charge on the membrane. And there are geological environments that have that same kind of structure and, uh, and charge and so on. Um, and then the second one is metabolism itself. And most people would kind of assume, you look at a metabolic map and you think, oh well, it's, you know, there's a lot of information involved in, in that. All the genes encode the enzymes which catalyze the individual steps. But actually it's more and more clear that all of this central core of metabolism just happens spontaneously. If you start in the right place and you drive it in the right way, um, it all just works out. Now, that's an overstatement at the moment, but that's one of the things that we're working on, is, is trying to demonstrate that all of these steps really do just happen spontaneously. And then the third one is information. Where does all this information come from? Um, and there are patterns in the genetic code that, that um, make predictions about interactions between amino acids and nucleotides uh, in RNA and so on uh, and they seem to be real as well we're looking at those and so we, we have a picture that effectively starts with energy goes into metabolism goes into information uh, linking up all the steps and asking specific questions along the way uh, and then testing them that's basically what we're doing so this is our microfluidic tip and where, by using which, we can do the carbon dioxide fixation experiment. So later, once I start the experiment running, you can see an um, iron sulfide, very thin layer of iron sulfide mineral being precipitated uh, inside this chip channel. And this very thin mineral barrier can separate the CO2 and hydrogen gas into acidic and alkaline conditions. And we believe this pH difference or pH gradient can make the carbon dioxide fixation possible and after that we can get some the most simple organic molecules like formate and acetate from the reaction of carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So the second part of what we do in the Lane group is the origins of intermediary metabolism. So we kind of try to understand how and why the way that modern cells make biomolecules like amino acids and nucleotides are universally conserved across all domains of life. And the way that we try to work this out is by replicating the chemistry in enzymes, but in the absence of the enzyme architecture. Um, so trying to mimic the chemistry, but without any of the stuff that biology makes it do looking at the same chemical steps um, and this is how we do that we set up uh, reactions screening prebiotically plausible catalysts like transition metal ions um, to see whether they are capable of doing the catalysis 
we've also progressing into looking at whether the cofactors that are conserved in enzyme sites can do the catalysis as well. Um, but in the absence of the protein, just whether bare components can be uh, achieved. So once we've done our experiments, the big thing that we need to do is work out whether we've actually made something. So one of the main things that we do in the lane lab is analytical chemistry. So we're looking to see whether in our solutions we have made a particular chemical of relevance. And we can do this via several means. Uh, our lab has two instruments, a high performance liquid chromatography machine here, where we uh, separate our molecules in the solution based on how they interact with a particular solid phase. And uh, we measure what's coming out based on UV and fluorescence. Sometimes that means we have to derivatize our compounds in order to make them UV or fluorescent. But uh, it's a really efficient method that we found worked really well for various analyses. So this is our other analytical machine, which is a GCMS, a gas chromatography mass spectrometer. And uh, it uses um, gases instead of liquids in order to separate molecules. And we determine what is in there by their masses. So they come out the column, get fragmented, and we detect all of those masses. And the fingerprints of those particular masses indicates what chemical we have present. So what comes out at the end of uh, a particular room is a chromatogram, like shown here, and each of these peaks corresponds to a different compound. And within each peak, we get a uh, mass spectrum shown here. And these are all of the ions that uh, come out and are detected at the detector, at the mass spec detector. And based on looking at what particular masses are here, and the ratio of the masses between each other, we can use that to infer what the actual molecule is. So in this instance, we have a fatty acid, fatty acid methyl ester here. Uh, and based on the fragmentation patterns, we can work out what particular groups and uh, structures are present. OK, so where are we? Uh, we're in a system where we have a very large and very complicated chemical reaction happening. Um, there's a lot to it, but in, it's entirely guided by thermodynamics at this point. It's just uh, a giant network of chemicals which is surprisingly robust. So the question is how do you get from what is effectively just a giant chemical reaction to something which can uh, have any novelty to it? So that's why I've been trying to simulate um, using a technique called molecular dynamics. Um, that involves uh, basically you simulate every single pair of an amino acid and an RNA base, which there is in the code, and measure how much time they spend next to each other. And we wanted to look and see if amino acids prefer to spend time next to, like if they interact better with the nucleotides which they are allocated to in the genetic code. And um, the results seem to be that um, somewhere around 50% of amino acids interact best with the nucleotides which encode them in the genetic code which we see today, which is a pretty strong link that's a lot higher than random. And when you look at not just whether they things, <clears throat> whether amino acids directly prefer the nucleotides which encode them or just have a sort of elevated preference to them, that goes up to like 95% better than random. It's, it's really good. What this means, if we take a step back, if we have any basically randomized sequence uh, of RNA, the amino acids which interact with that should be non-random. This means we're turning sequence into function effectively uh, without any real coding or translational machinery. We should expect to see uh, short RNAs generated sort of spontaneously from the chemical network, which we would say is the origin of life, um, we, we can start getting things which look like the inheritable base units of modern cells, like 
uh, effectively a genome of short RNAs without any of the machinery which we would think of today as being required to produce that function. Uh, and that's pretty exciting. We can skip a lot of the problems there which people tie themselves in knots over in this field. The traditional idea of the origin of life everyone's heard of is the primordial sip. Yeah. Which actually is a UCL thing. It goes back to Haldane, JBS Haldane, mm -hmm. who was a, a professor at UCL for most of his career. Actually, he came up with the primordial soup while he was in Cambridge, and it's a really bad idea. Okay. Uh, I mean, Haldane was a great guy in many ways, but he was wrong about it a lot. You know, it's one yeah. one thing that I, I have learned that I personally find most um, helpful, actually, as a scientist, is that all these great scientists of the past were wrong about most of the stuff that they did. Yeah. Um, and that kind of gives you permission to be wrong about most of the stuff you do as well, which yeah. is which is a freedom. It means that you can think more boldly, you can try and go to pla interesting places. Maybe you're wrong about it, uh, but it's, it's fun. So, the primordial soup um, is just a bad idea, but it's an idea that people have got in their head. And effectively what it is, is you have lightning strikes, or you have UV radiation, is acting on gases in the atmosphere like methane and ammonia and hydrogen and so on. And it forms a warm, dilute soup of organic molecules. Uh, and then somehow this congeals, and it congeals into genes, into RNA specifically. And that starts inventing metabolism, and it eats this soup, until the soup runs out and then it has to find a way of you know, making its own soup. Mm. And this whole story, uh, mm -hmm. what it's missing is energy flow. It's missing the, the kind of the, the reactivity uh, which is driving chemistry to do more and more complex things. Um, and that's really where autotrophic origins come in. We're starting with the simplest building blocks, CO2 and hydrogen, and we're, we're reacting them, and as they react, they make things, and then they react more, they make more things, they react more, they make, and so then you get self-organization, because you've got this continuous flow, you've got a far from equilibrium environment, it tends to form cell-like shapes and things. So you, you, you've got a, a very, very different conception of what's required for the origin of life.